Well, um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chancellor Dirks, friends, ladies, and colleagues. Um, I'm really grateful for the invitation to address you this afternoon. It's kind of strange as a topic because um, as a vice chancellor, I'm used to being asked to talk about universities' roles in incubating innovation or in fueling economic growth or driving research agendas. Oddly enough, it's much rarer, and I'd say most welcome, that we should be gathered here to, uh, today to consider the connection between world-class universities and the public good. Now, for me, this is a subject I feel passionately about, and one that because it's difficult to measure or to quantify, it's all too often overlooked. I struggle to see what metric you would place on these uh, criteria, and yet every one of us in this room knows that they're absolutely vital to the continued success of our institutions. And my interest in the subject stems partly from my clinical background, and in particular, my formative experiences of clinical practice when I was practicing in West Africa. And these days, I've continued that commitment because in addition to Cambridge, I'm chair of the advisory committee for the UK's Department for International Development. And I also chair a small foundation that seeks to develop and deliver drugs for neglected tropical diseases to patients around the world who cannot ever afford the full cost of that medication. So I'm very clear that when I talk about contributing to the public good, I really do mean it in the widest possible sense. Now, we've heard earlier today about the role of universities in reversing widening inequality. There has been some discussion about the social value of universities and about whether investment in higher education should be seen as a form of investment in the public good. Now, as I go, I may pick up on some of these strands, uh, but I'd also like to take a slightly different angle. I'm going to try and argue that there are two prerequisites in order for institutions like the University of Cambridge to fulfill their obligation to contribute to the public good. And those two are public trust and autonomy. So I'm gonna start by asking what we mean by the public good and how we serve it. Now, in this context, I will always refer to our university's mission statement. I hate mission statements. They usually go on for five pages and it's full of gobbledygook and doesn't mean anything whatsoever. Um, Cambridge has uh, taken its uh, sentiment very much from Winston Churchill when he wrote at the end of a rather long letter uh, to his wife and he said, if I'd had more time, this message would have been shorter. Um, and our mission statement is the shortest uh, I've ever seen. And it's very simple, it's one sentence. It just says, to contribute to society through the pursuit of education, learning and research at the highest international levels of excellence. And that's it. No ifs, ands, or buts, that's what we're about. But what do we mean when we talk about contributing to society? The question comes, what society, or indeed societies, do we actually serve? Now for any institution, uh, at our most immediate level, of course, our first commitment is to local communities. And for some universities, it stops there. Let's be clear, universities create jobs, support livelihoods far beyond their own walls in relationship to their community. Today, uh, in the small city of Cambridge, and I just realized how small it is, we were talking about small cities of a million, we have 100,000 residents in the city of Cambridge. The University of Cambridge is at the center of a cluster, which is Europe's largest cluster, of 4,300 businesses that employ 58,000 people in the city and surrounding areas working on know-how spun out from the university. For the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that delivers about 13 billion sterling per annum. So this matters for the United Kingdom. That's the same level of return as Rolls-Royce returned in the same year. So this matters. 
And as Europe's most successful cluster, it's actually delivered a peculiarity. It's delivered a GDP growth rate of 8.8% last year, something probably only matched by China. Sadly for the United Kingdom, it stops beyond a 10-mile radius of Cambridge. So we live in a little cocoon which is actually being created by the well-being created by university know-how, but it's certainly changed the nature of lives of residents who live in our, our um, community. And we make capital investments in that community, such as the Northwest Cambridge campus. They not only address the university's need for expansion, but address some of the region's urgent housing and transport needs. That's the problem of success, is the infrastructure is, has to be supported as well. And that investment for the university is a one billion pound sterling investment to provide 5,000 accommodation units and will add 10 to 15% to the size of the city. But it includes facilities for the city, and particularly a university primary school for 700 children. It is the first primary school in the UK to be managed by a university, and oddly enough, I opened it just before flying over to San Francisco yesterday, it made the flight with seven minutes to spare. So why do this? Well, the truth is the data shows that inequality of attainment in education, certainly in the United Kingdom, starts at the age of three. You can already see the social divides and the financial divides by parental income at assessment of kids by the age of three. If you can't break through at primary level, your aspiration to attainment at higher education is for naught. Our argument is it is no good starting at the age of 16 worrying about higher education if you don't deal with an underlying problem. So understanding how to do this has to be done in partnership with experts in primary and secondary education. Guess what? That means working not with our academics but with teachers on the ground to begin to help set curricula that may make an effort to turning around a rather chronic long-term problem that we've, we've, we face. So we are deeply embedded in and committed to serving our local community. But then I suppose we also serve societies at the national level too. All of us here, everyone in this room, are standard bearers. And indeed, I'm going to say standard setters for the higher education sectors in our countries. Now this privileged position creates obligations on us. And we should all be very familiar with the words from those who have been entrusted with much, much more will be demanded. And that is particularly true of higher education. And within our respective countries, we've been entrusted and expected to do so much. It's things that are often beyond our normal remit or our mission statements. We're relied upon to deliver the discoveries that will fuel our country's development. We're asked to nurture the academic, professional, business, and civic leadership that our countries require. We're called upon to instill the attitudes that will transform our countries in the decades ahead, very probably in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine at the present time. So the argument has to be that contributing to society at the national level means engaging with national conversations that have repercussions beyond the labs and the lecture halls that we normally frequent. For instance, as the demand for access to higher education grows in all our countries, how do we balance the need to widen participation with the need to ensure that academic attainment remains the basis for admission and is also needs blind? How do we weigh the imperative to defend freedom of expression and freedom of inquiry within our institutions against a duty to protect our staff and our students from views that can be considered offensive or even harmful? 
There are no easy questions, but we have to engage in these debates. So our institution's response to these and other predicaments will set the standard for how our societies respond to them. So, yep, we serve our societies at the local and national level. But we also serve society in a much more important and comprehensive, indeed, in a global sense. And I'd like to just dwell on this for a minute. As I constantly remind my colleagues in Cambridge, there are currently 1.2 billion people around the world living in extreme poverty with all the pernicious effects this has on health, education, and nutrition. That's 15% of the total population. Some 4 billion are still living on under $9 a day, and 1 billion children worldwide are living in poverty. The facts go on. 805 million people do not have enough food to eat. And there are more than 750 million people with lack of adequate access to clean drinking water. If you listen to the UN, you think this is an X problem. It's a huge real problem. So just ponder in those countries, and we have to work in DFID with the 30 poorest countries in, uh, in the world, higher education, and for that matter, secondary education is given a back seat. Yet, as Secretary Reichs pointed out, there is a huge demand for this level of attainment in any progressive society. If they have no tertiary education, they have no good secondary education, are these countries forever doomed to second-class status? Or can we and should we, as world-class universities, do more? So these are the most obvious among the many challenges we face. And as recent events have shown, no institution, no country, no matter how seemingly isolated, is immune to the impact of humanitarian tragedies occurring somewhere else on the planet. So the society we serve is no longer limited to our community, in my case, in the fens of the United Kingdom, or even to the country we serve, or even the region we serve, but actually to this small planet we all live on. So whether it's the understanding of the molecular basis of neurodegenerative disease, or helping farmers in India increase yield, or discovering better ways to live in large cities, I know what we do in Cambridge affects lives and livelihoods the world over. The men and women we educate hailing from over 120 countries around the world, as from most world-leading universities, are likely in turn to become leaders of government, of civil society, of academia, of industry, in the countries of their origin. This is what I mean by contributing to society. And it, it is in its broadest sense that I would actually understand serving the wide public good, the global public good, not some sort of microcosm of it in one part uh, of this planet. Now, changing tack. Now, there is an unwritten but widely accepted contract between society and higher education institutions. Remember, we are given the license to operate by society, the space to educate and generate knowledge. Why? My argument would be because we deliver excellence at the end of the day. And the public trust placed in us is directly linked to an understanding that our pursuit of excellence in education, learning, and research is for the benefit of that society. In fact, we gain public trust by reaffirming that society's goals are also our goals. We also gain public trust by widening access and enhancing levels of participation. But above all, we gain public trust by being open about what we do and about how we do it. There is another way in which we gain that public trust. Universities and research intensive universities in particular are perhaps the only modern institutions with the means and the legitimacy 
to bridge the gaps between disciplines, between different sectors of society, and between different cultures. Think about it. Where else is the last bastion where you can actually bridge the arts and humanities alongside sciences in debate and public discussion of many of the issues? Remove universities, no research institute will do it. No industry will do it. And certainly no government will do it because the divisions would be too difficult for them to cope with. Yet we do it. And actually, guess what? I think most of us enjoy doing it. So this legitimacy gives us a convening power unlike anyone else's. No institutions are better placed than ours to bring together policymakers, non-governmental and international organizations, businesses, and the knowledge community to thrash out solutions to the big challenges ahead. And this legitimacy allows us to lead in efforts that improve lives, not just on our own doorstep, but wherever in the world that improvement is needed. Now, here we are. There's a stone's throw away from Silicon Valley. We just do a thought experiment. Imagine that a CEO of an influential social media company announces that she wishes to invest significant amounts of her capital in her company in order to cure a disease. Ask yourselves the question, what do people, i.e. the wider society, immediately think? Do they think she's a great philanthropist? Or do they wonder what's in it for her and her company? I don't wish to throw any shades on anyone's philanthropic aspirations, but it simply reflects where public opinion and ultimately trust tends to gravitate towards, which is why philanthropists have so often decided to partner with universities, just as Facebook has very recently and very generously done with Berkeley and Stanford. The public trust us, the universities, because we're not subjected to the short-term goals of policymakers who have to deliver to their constituents in a fixed democratic timetable, or to the even shorter-term goals of industries who have to deliver to shareholders in annual or biannual meetings. I think of my own discipline of medicine, where the process of translating a bench discovery to an actual therapeutic use can take on average 17 years. And that doesn't matter whether you're in Europe, in Asia, or in North America. The data is all the same. In the world of policy or in the world of business, this is far too long to withhold opportunities for wider societies. And who's going to be trusted to buck that trend? My argument is going to be universities, not a company, certainly, and not a government because we are trusted with long-term planning over short-term gain. And I'm going to go so far as to say that they are among the very few places where long-term planning of 30 to 40 years still happens. Because our major product, if you want to convert to business language, is the student. And very often, they will not deliver of their best for 30 or more years. Now, all of this is well and good, and then a little bit of it is motherhood and apple pie, but, so, but there is a caveat to it all. Like our reputations, this public trust is hard won and very, very easily lost. And one of the biggest risks to our legitimacy as honest brokers is the public feeling that the university's goals and our society's goals are no longer shared or in alignment. There's a particular worry for me ahead of the UK's June referendum was a rhetoric that began to build up in the United Kingdom surrounding evidence-based arguments, famously summarized by the Leavers in the phrase, Britain has had enough of experts. Now, if that's really so, and it would be a mistake to underestimate the strength of this feeling or the sense of grievance felt by many, then we universities need to make a better case for our role as institutions that contribute to the public good. 
standing on the sidelines is just not good enough. If society does not believe that we have its interests at heart, we need to do a better job at engaging with it and communicating the impact of what we do. It is actually in our gift to cultivate that public trust, and it's also in our hands to squander it, and the choice is ours. So I've said, and I hope you'll agree, that universities can only contribute to the public good if they have the full trust of the public they serve. But there's another variable in this equation. Do we have autonomy? Are we actually in a position to make those decisions as to where our institutions are going? And institutional autonomy is essential for universities to effectively discharge their duties. Not only does it help to protect our ability to deliver the excellence we should always aspire to, but it safeguards the most fundamental tenet of higher education, the academic freedom of inquiry. Naturally, we expect autonomy to be grounded in a proper recognition of the skills and qualifications of teachers and researchers, and nor do I resist the notion of being properly monitored by relevant independent bodies to define and to determine the quality of our output. But as the head of a world-leading global university, I would be concerned by attempts to direct or to determine by committee what and how universities should be doing. And there is an academic argument for this. We must fiercely defend the right to carve out a space for intellectual inquiry that will not be obviously or immediately impactful because we know that the benefit to society may come many years down the line. And we need to still have that public trust in that particular statement that they trust us to deliver in that long term. And universities need the autonomy and the flexibility that associates itself with it then to make decisions for ourselves. The truth is that we never know how today's blue skies research will turn into tomorrow's innovation. And while I don't know where string theory will take us in due course, what I'm pretty certain is somewhere in this room, some academic will find a way of ensuring it will be used for the betterment of society. That's a statement of confidence. It may take 20 years, but it has a habit to happen. But there is another argument which I'm going to tie into my earlier remarks. The public trust that allows us to do what we do is intrinsically linked to public perceptions that we're able to function with autonomy. Frankly, if our institutional autonomy is eroded, so is the public trust in what we do. Because increasingly, society loses trust in institutions that are dictated to. And losing society's trust leads to a further erosion of our ability to deliver excellence in research, learning, and education. These are all inextricably linked and have to be defended and used together. Now, I've made the case that autonomy and public trust are linked and that they're both essential to our ability to contribute to the public good. But I hear a question being raised. Does the pursuit of the global public good stand in the way of our need for autonomy? Now, I turn that question around and challenge my Cambridge colleagues by asking, as we have the autonomy that we control in Cambridge, should we not be prepared to give up some of that autonomy to work with partners? And I think here in particular about partners in the developing world to tackle some of the monumental global challenges ahead. If we're not prepared to give up some of that autonomy that we prize, do we not risk failing the global public good? So autonomy is a prerequisite for excellence but autonomy is not an excuse for isolation. I've often argued that at a time of ever more complex problems, we can only deliver excellence in partnership with others, with other universities, with donors, with governments, with industry, and with NGOs. 
To give you an example of this, our commitment to primary education in Cambridge is now enhanced by a partnership with a charity named CAMFED to edu educate 700,000 girls in sub-Saharan Africa alongside in-country Cambridge fellowship programs. But because we engage in-country, 50 out of the 55 fellows are still working in their home institutions in-country, but in networks that through our university can be supported globally. And we're giving up that autonomy to those individuals to help them establish a way of working and a presence in their own country so that some of those poorer countries can create the institutions they will need so that they do not have a legacy of always being second-class global citizens. So from mitigating the effects of antimicrobial resistance, improving crop yields or ensuring energy security, climate change challenges that we face are all global, and therefore so must be the solutions and the research that underpins them. So collaboration between research performing institutions, I would actually argue, is no longer optional. It's an absolute necessity. And it is not merely an added extra to our institution's daily work. It has to be embedded in all the work that we do. So no matter how good it is, no matter how well established, no matter how much of an endowment it has, an individual research performing organization cannot attain excellence in terms of global challenges on its own. So world-class institutions have to have the confidence and must harness the power of strategic partnerships. Now resources for higher education diminish and we've heard a lot about it and that probably is inexorable. And challenges are increasing in complexity and scale this is becoming more and more of a global imperative if we are to truly serve society. The lone researcher, even the lone institution, is probably not a viable model for delivery of the underpinning activities that are necessary in all disciplines if we're truly to challenge, for instance, the energy crisis or mitigation of climate change. But there is good news. We have more tools at our disposal than ever to facilitate these interactions. A couple of days ago, we've entered into an agreement with industry and academic partners in India to enhance the productivity of India's corn crops. We work intensively with partners in Ghana and Uganda to build research capacity in sub-Saharan Africa, and this is supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And every one of you can cite lots of examples like that. And we're partners with the University of California here in Berkeley and the National University of Singapore in coordinated research projects on smart systems, precision medicine and cities. These joint ventures will help us develop a systems approach to real problems such as air pollution, which will impact not just in Singapore or here in California, but in Mexico City and Mumbai. So ladies and gentlemen, I apologize if you feel I'm very passionate about this particular topic. And that apology is only partial because the truth is I am. In fulfilling our ambition to serve society, we rely on our continued and indeed enhanced collaboration with our partners. Far from forcing us to relinquish our autonomy, these collaborations help us to underscore it because they reiterate that our purpose is to contribute to society and we're using that autonomy in a globally important and sustainable way. And global cooperation based on in-country engagement is the embodiment of our commitment to the public good. By helping us to cultivate and maintain the public trust, global collaboration is the only way we can attain, ensure we attain and continue to deliver true academic excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Passionate uh, exposition of, of what Cambridge does. I, I'll, I'll ask question, for questions in a moment. I'd, I'd just like to start off bringing you back to Brexit because it was such a, 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 an almost traumatic moment in, in British political life 
Um, not long ago, I think a lot of people in Britain haven't got over it yet, but I think I'm right in saying that universities were deeply shocked by the result on the 23rd of June. They didn't see it coming at all. Um, you may disagree, but that was my impression, that it was, it was almost a sort of sense of complacency amongst those of us that live in London, perhaps, those of us who are uh, graduates versus non-graduates, and, and people just didn't sort of envisage this as being a possibility, and yet it happened. Um, and you talked a great deal about trust. I wonder, looking back, back with the benefit of hindsight, whether you can sort of put your finger on how universities lost touch with where the country was going, or where the loss of trust, if that is what happened there, occurred. I'm not sure it is a loss of trust. If you look at the issues that finally decided Brexit, let's be clear, higher education was somewhere about 49th in a list of 50. The major issues that we do know that were being voted on were actually issues that surrounded immigration, issues that surrounded a nebulous concept of what could constitute sovereignty, um, and uh, others who believed that there was no need to listen to experts because they knew better. And it, it is very interesting for those who did not engage in the debate, you may well say you didn't see it coming. During my time in, in arguing for remaining in Europe, I spent a lot of time going around East Anglia. Mm. And it came as no surprise to me that the city of Cambridge voted by 76% to remain in Europe. Six miles north of the city, it was 75% to leave. And this is a measure of where those who benefit from a cosmopolitan society was more an argument to me of the haves and have nots. And if I take away an abiding message from it, it is take and listen to the variety of messages that are coming from across the country. Don't just speak to the converted because you end up in real trouble. Um, I'm certainly not going to draw any conclusions or comments for the uh, American election, but it's something that people have to take very seriously that some of the arguments may not be the arguments of fact that we feel should be uh, all embracing mm -hmm. as academics. But in reality, as one of my friends said to me, I voted to leave because I voted with my heart, not my head. My counter argument is well, wait for the economic problems that will follow. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. there's a strong sense of feeling that people were doing this because they did not like it for a number of reasons, which frankly had very little to do with higher education. Mm. Let's have some questions from the floor. Um, there's a mic here. There's a, a gentleman with his hand up here. If you could just tell us who you are and your institution as well. Yeah, I'm Chan Shekhar Dube. I'm from Delhi University. I'm really thankful that you have answered my morning question just now. Uh, well, you see, the most important thing is we are totally different what we are looking at here, you know. You said that primary is the basic, and here in our country, $330 we spend for higher education, $200 we spend for per capita per student, invest for medium and secondary education, and you know, just $50 to $60 for primary education. So that's a flip thing which is making a problem to us. The other important thing is that what I was talking, and I think that you have already said in that, that if the collaborations are from that side to this side looking at our problems, I think that can, that can make the global, you know, uh, globally sustainable system, you know. But I feel that there is a, do you think that there is a kind of a, a distancing rather than coming forward like you have done it for others? Yeah, I think that there are two issues here that are very important and please do not misunderstand me. I'm a great believer that no matter how poor a country is, it must aspire to have a tertiary education institution in that country. Because without it, you are never going to be able to educate the teachers and those who are going to be leaders in that country because they will dissipate. So you've got to draw a balance, and I would be very supportive that a university-style education should be present in every single country of the world with a degree of autonomy about how it chooses to engage. For many, that will be a teaching-orientated uh, mission, but the very fact it exists is absolutely vital. Secondly, the issue of collaboration. 
something that I've spoken about previously and feel very strongly about is collaboration always is a two-way street. So, for example, with India, my, my own institution has 280 uh, projects, and we only have about 1,400 uh, professorial staff, so this is quite a fair number of them will have at least one project with India. I haven't told them to do that, and frankly, I can tell you they won't look at any ratings or rankings uh, to decide on that. They decide on the individual excellence of the collaborators they work with and how you have complementarity in ensuring that collaboration works. And we always aspire in those collaborations to have students coming out from Cambridge to the field as much as we will try to encourage some movement in two directions, because both are learning. And the example that I gave uh, where we are looking at corn production in India is a problem we wouldn't have even come across, but it's a fascinating basic question. If you take a standard maize corn, uh, you know, it grows up to six feet. It takes an awful lot of fertilizer, a lot of nitrogen that is washed away into the environment and elsewhere. And yet, if you're looking to make a cash crop of baby corn, just imagine you have a six-foot plant for three corns of this size. Couldn't we get some of our basic scientists now to drop the canopy size for baby corn we don't, as we dwarfed with wheat so that we actually reduce the amount of nitrogen usage and pesticide that is actually utilized in those populations? I wouldn't have thought of the problem, but the agricultural university, the Punjab, is faced with that on a day-to-day -day basis, and they've brought an absolutely fascinating uh, biology challenge uh, to, to some of our academics in Cambridge who are fascinated by that particular problem. And both of us working together can achieve something. And primary education is not something Cambridge is going to be teaching a mass of teachers. There are better institutions to do it. But what we can do is to help states in India, for example, evaluate uh, whether their primary school teaching remains up to the sort of standards that they require if they're truly going to be able to move into the technological uh, revolution that is going to happen in that very populous country. And we have similar engagements with China and with other parts of the world. But just to answer your question, that's where I actually see this issue of collaboration going. More questions? There's an arm up at the back here. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Neil, coming from uh, Mexico, Tecnológico de Monterrey. So uh, you, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very nice and interesting exposition on, on your thoughts. Uh, if I can uh, make a, a little, um, some of the ideas you, you put on the table are contribution to global challenges, collaboration across academia and out of the borders of the university, and public and uh, private partnerships. So uh, my question is, what do you think about the new teaching models for university? That means how can we support from academia, from a university, these challenges you are putting on the table? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, here I think you have to look at where different institutions are best able to support particular models. So for example, um, in Cambridge, we have a collegiate-based system, which is probably one of the most expensive higher education systems to deliver. If you challenge me and said in a developing country, would I promote the model we have in Cambridge, the answer is probably not. Other things, uh, cost will actually defray that. Similarly, if we have to help in the mass education of teachers, I would be the first to admit that in the United Kingdom, the Open University may be better placed to do that than Cambridge University. So collaboration here is horses for courses as the best institution to be able to tackle the individual problem. And I'm very happy to not to claim that Cambridge University can do all of this. We can't. So we're good at what we do. And if it's a case of collaboration on a problem in basic physics, um, ourselves or Berkeley here may be very good partners to engage in. If the problem is one of better mass education of teachers or the production of better online learning, then there may be others who will be able to help in that situation. So for me, it is not about tying institution to institution in a bound way. It's actually to keep the freedom of operation for both partners in all circumstances. I've been challenged, for example, on how would I 
take success in collaboration with a university in a developing uh, country. And my own view is success to me would be defined when that institution was able to turn around after seven or eight years and say, do you know what? We no longer wish to collaborate with Cambridge because we have a better deal or a better engagement with Berkeley. That's a little bit like a parent having to let go of its children and being prepared to say, that's great. They're now grown up and they're making their own uh, arrangements. And that's something as an institution we should be proud of uh, in having helped in that <coughs> way. So it's about leaving the freedom and that word again, autonomy, for the institution you're trying to partner with to be able to make its decisions uh, as, it, uh, as it chooses, not to constrain them by some sort of binding agreement forever and a day. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but can I just ask one question that's related, which is about um, your, your concept of the global public good. Um, we've heard a lot today about universities having to scrap for every shred of legitimacy and, and, and political support locally and within the systems that they operate, but um, you accrue a certain amount of credit, I'm sure, for the stuff that you do locally to Cambridge and nationally within the UK, but it's probably much harder to hope that you will accrue considerable credit from within your national system for work that you do all around the world for this global public good. Does that matter? Or do universities such as Cambridge just have to say, well, it's the right thing to do, it's what we do, so I we won't worry about that? I think it comes down to uh, a, 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 a situation of confidence in yourself. I'm very confident that we're able to deliver the component parts of both the uh, local good that actually accrues. Uh, we also, I'm also very confident that as an institution it will continue to deliver uh, the, uh, the basic work that was alluded to earlier today. I mean, the truth of it is the more that we do in the applied end, frankly, the, the better the basic work becomes. In fact, we, I drew out a graph the other day that the number of Nobel Prizes Cambridge has actually won has increased in frequency um, ever since we've actually begun to develop the Cambridge phenomenon. So this idea that you'll do one or t'other is just not true. You end up doing them both. And for me, the build-up of the international is built in the context of an institution that cares as much about the national good and the local good um, that therefore this international good is then seen as us being a responsible institution in bringing those opportunities to others. My own belief is if we fail to do that, remember where the demography of the world is going. Britain is going to be a very small place and there are many friends we will need around a very much a global world. And that hand of friendship offered now to burgeoning institutions is actually likely to benefit the UK in the longer term a lot more than any idea of closing uh, ranks within the, the UK. Mm. It was one of the reasons why I felt so passionately about remaining in Europe, which was actually to build up those international collaborations so that our students could benefit in a truly global uh, enterprise. They enjoy it. And I believe that that will actually ensure that our reputation will actually be enhanced considerably uh, by this engagement on the international stage, as will any other world-leading universities. In fact, I would actually challenge them, can you call yourself a world-leading university if you're not global? We're out of time. I'm really sorry, I see some hands cropping up, but uh, there's a red light flashing at me. We're going to have to call, call it a day there. Thank you so much for that uh, fascinating speech and, and Q&A session. So let's get rid of it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs>